Our final class service will be in the fellowship hall. This will be a child-focused and family-friendly service. Our seminary class service will be in the sanctuary, and worship will include candlelight and communion, with special music that will begin at 6.30. This service will also be live streamed. If you cannot make it to either of those services, we will have the digital services available starting in Two, I like it. This is the only shirt I've got that's got red in it, so I have to wear it like all of December. I just keep pulling it out and wearing it again. I guess I could put a bow on. That would be festive too, right? Maybe I'm being too cheap.
difficult to love my neighbor when I cannot love myself. God's grace is sufficient for us and made perfect in our weakness. Perfect love casts out all fears, even our fears of inadequacy, unworthiness, and shame. May each of us experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand it fully. Then we will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. People of love, we light the fourth candle to remind us that we are both worthy of love and capable of love. Perfect love and, the, and perfect love, the God kind of love, Cast out all fear. We can love others and ourselves because he first loved us. Shares the good news that 
you will walk with us through the waters, through those times where we feel like we are suffocating by the things around us, the busyness of life, the daily tasks that keep coming at us one after the other after the other. Lord, you're with us when it seems like the world is coming against us. And you remind us that you walk with us through that. Just as you walked with the people and Moses as they exited the promised land and you parted the sea. So God, our prayer today is that you will continue to walk with us, but that we will notice when you are parting the seas, when you are keeping our head afloat in the midst of all the things around us. And Lord, you also remind us through the prophet Isaiah that you'll walk with us through the fires of life. Lord, you brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, unscathed. But Lord, they were changed. They were different. And so, Lord, we know when we walk through the fires of life, whether it be death, sickness, illness, hardship, persecution, that we too will walk through that unscathed because of you. But we will be forever changed. And so, Lord, our prayer is this morning in those fiery places of life that you will hold us fast, that we might lean on your truth, that we will remain faithful, that we will hold firm in your love. And that love is Jesus Christ who comes to us at Christmas, that is given to us as a free gift, that in the promises of Isaiah are foretold that when we walk through these places, you will not only just go with us, but you offer us life and life eternal. That those things that we endure or experience do not have a hold on us. That there is eternal life because of you. Oh God, through the gift of Jesus Christ. So Lord, our prayer is today that we will cling to that gift. And in these next six days, as we walk toward that manger and toward that cross, that we hold fast to your love. Lord, we lift up specifically Winston Lyrely, because he's in hospice now, God. So be with Susan and Paige and little Winston as they surround their family. Lord, be with those in the hospital, Kathy Schofield, and those that are in nursing homes and rehab centers, or those that are facing surgery, oh God. We ask for your comfort and peace in all of those situations. May it be your will, O oh God. Provide strength for those that are caring for them and those that surround them. And Lord, our prayer list seems to grow and grow and grow. And the praises seem to grow as well. But God, in the midst of all of it, help us to come together and pray as a unified body of Christ, lifting up our brothers and sisters. And when we fail to have the words to say. Let us be reminded of the words that you offered and taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have traveled 
So this morning we have the pleasure of having Reverend Justin Smith back with us. Justin is the minister um, at Appalachian State University. He leads the Wesley Foundation there. So he is a, serving in extension ministry um, in, for the Western North Carolina Conference. And so Justin is a friend of mine. We went to, uh, through residence and ordained ministry with a mouthful. Um, and we were ordained together. And so I welcome him as my friend and also back here with us. Thank you. It is uh, great to be back here in Hickory and uh, to share with you uh, this morning during this Advent season. So uh, as we go into this Advent season, you'll probably uh, uh, notice that in the next few weeks or so, maybe there's some vacations or you're going on vacations or taking some breaks uh, from work and such. And uh, Monica may be able to attest to this, but like most pastors... I rarely take all the vacation time that is allotted to me. Now, I, I enjoy what I do, to put it simply. I enjoy what I do at App State. I've been in ministry for eight years, finishing up my second year with the Wesley Foundation, and I still find it hard to take that time for myself. Now, this is due to the fact that I take uh, seriously the passions that fill my heart. And I remember learning that when we are passionate about something, meaning we really love doing something specifically because it is life-giving, then it really doesn't feel like work. It really doesn't feel like work. Now, I do know that I have work to do to get better at this work-life balance in my life, but there's something about being home, we'll get to that in a moment, there's something about the feeling of home that fuels my passions for doing the kingdom work that we've all been called to do in varying and unique ways. Now I say all of that to say that I love being home. How many of you love just to be home, right? Just love, love being home. Now, I know that in this space today, home means different things to different folks. I'm in tune with the fact that not everyone loves home as we generally define it. We know that there are issues in certain homes, and some of us in this place today may not want to go home following worship this morning. And that's why we'll focus on the uh, different definition of home in just a few moments. Defining it maybe in a, in a different way for us all, in a scriptural, in a spiritual way of what home may be for us. Now, is defining that for each and every one of us going to be easy? No, it's not. And will we leave here today understanding even more what home may be for each and every one of us? Maybe not for that either. But my hope is that we can begin at least a process, it's a great word in our Wesleyan Methodist tradition, a process of figuring out and discerning what coming and going home may be for each and every one of us. And in due time, with the movement of God's spirit and the movement of God's overarching grace, that we can come to a definition of home for us that fills our passions, that fills our passions and brings peace to our hearts. So I mentioned earlier that I'm not very good at using all of the vacation and free time that, I, uh, that is given to me during the year. I, I take a few weeks a year, and one of those specifically is in the, in the month of July, when my entire family, that's my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters-in-law and nephews and nieces, all 14 of us, go and stay at the same place, same house at the beach. We spend that week with one another. We enjoy the views. We enjoy playing in the sand, splashing around the water, eating till our hearts are content. 
However, about three days into this, I'm ready to be home. Because I love home. In my personal context, there's something about having and being in my own bed, about my own couch, about my own TV, my own space. But there's also this context of home that I love what I am able and called to do for a living, to pastoral and executive leadership. And so I long, when I'm away, I long to be back home to those life-giving passions of crafting, creating, planning, and implementing various ministry opportunities. So sometimes when I am away, when I am probably forced to take those vacations and free times, that I actually long to be back in that home space doing what I'm called to do. Today I felt called back home and in the space of home when we when I read again for today our scripture of the beautiful story of God's calling upon Mary. In our gospel message today we'll read it in just a moment we read of a young girl who sings a song of praise and thanksgiving to God because she has been called to be a part of the story of God's redemption through love of the world. So I invite us to look at that, that calling of Mary, to look at Mary's song of thanksgiving and praise. It comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and we will read uh, 39 through 55. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as, I, for as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts and lifted up. Oh, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants. Forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This passage spoke to me many years ago, and it reminds me and speaks to me again year after year when we are able to read it again of how God continues to call me home. Call me home to the passionate work of ministry. Now, coming to the spiritual recognition of being God's child is a process within each and every one of us. This process, it plays out differently for each and every one of us, too. To some, coming to an awakening and an acceptance of God's grace and movement in your life can be swift and sudden. For others, 
It may be slow as molasses. But in whichever form that it comes, in whichever way that you are in the movement of identifying and discerning God's call in your life, it is perfectly fine. For me, it has been a steady, it has been a steady moving stream, which began for me to my earliest recollection being around five or six years old. Music has been a central piece to God's calling upon my life. When I was around five or six years old, I began playing the organ by ear. And I give much thanks to Mabel Cathy, who was the organist at Covenant United Methodist Church in Charlotte, who is now one of those saints that has gone on before us. But I give thanks to her for allowing me, for encouraging me to sit at the organ bench and play hymns that I had heard during that worship service that day. Now, let me say this. Musicians can be, and it sometimes maybe should be, a little territorial about expensive instruments like organs and pianos. But Miss Mabel didn't stand over my shoulder. She didn't create a roadblock. She didn't watch every movement that I made. She allowed trust, lived into trust, and stood back to just let me figure it out. And I tell you this because music is a large part of my call into ministry and where I am today. So that moment when I was five or six years old, let's fast forward now to 2009 when I'm about 22 or 23 years old. And there was some turmoil in my home church as many churches in the life cycle, that happens. That's, it's just a part of our identity. And because of that, I was thrust into being the organist and director of worship and arts at Covenant. This meant planning the music, rehearsing on the organ, directing the chancel choir, making sure all was in order for the worship services. And that piece of 2009 led me to then going in 2011, a few years later, to seminary. And in seminary, I was not really feeling the call or being directed by anyone really into the ordination process. Rather, I was sort of just wanting to get a deeper understanding and educational background foundation for what it was I was doing in directing and planning and implementing worship services. But the last semester was quickly approaching in 2014, the spring there. And something began to stir a little bit deeper in my heart. There was a longing to know what what were the next steps? What were the next steps? So as a director and, and worship arts and music director, you get sent mountains from publishers, mountains of music books and choral preview CDs. They want you to purchase the next big and greatest anthem that will pump up the church, right? I would have stacks of catalogs and CDs on my desk. But I remember this one particular day it was the last semester of seminary, spring 2014. I had this CD in the passenger seat of my car, sitting, sitting in the church parking lot. I put it in, and after a few skips of some songs that really weren't that great, there was one that piqued my interest with the chorus that rang out, Be born in me, be born in me. Trembling heart, somehow I believe that you chose me. I'll hold you in the beginning, you will hold me in the end. Every moment in the middle, make my heart your Bethlehem. Be born in me. I sat in the parking lot of the church... I was about to head up Interstate 85 to Salisbury to Hood Theological Seminary to get back to it for the start of classes. And I played that song on repeat over and over again. It takes a lot to make me cry, but I let the tears run down my cheek this day as I again accepted that 
God's call upon my life was for God's ministry to be born through me in pastoral leadership. And so it's on this day, today, that we were able to hear again that it's a reminder for me, for all of us, the original lyrics of Mary's Magnificat in the Gospel of Luke. That Mary is called home. Called home to be the bearer of God's salvific act. Jesus the Christ. Emmanuel. God with us. But there's more to what Mary is doing here. What Mary's call is and what it does and how it moves the world. What is it that Mary is being called to on behalf of the whole world here? Well, there's another song. Music speaks to me. There's another song that I just recently learned. It's called The Canticle of Turning. And the Irish tune says that God, in the movement of Mary, is turning the world around. Changing the world. Making the opposite the new normal. The chorus of this song states, My heart shall sing of the day you bring. Let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears. For the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. We are called to transform the world and make disciples. And Mary is being used to show us that way. Because I'm reminded day in and day out through God's grace that God's light, God's peace, the Spirit can be shown through me and through each and every one of you if we allow God to be born in and through us. Dr. William Barclay is a Scottish New Testament scholar and he defined Mary's song of praise as we find it in the gospel today and calling this way. That her song of praise is a social, moral, and economic revolution. Her singing and accepting what God and giving God praise for what God is using her for is a social revolution because God, as she sings, God scatters the proud in the plans of, of their hearts, enabling Christ to enable us to see ourselves and make a change. We call that repentance, right? Turning around. Mary sings this song of praise and calling as a moral revolution. God casts down the mighty. God exalts the humble. Christianity puts an end to the world's labels and prestige. Turning the world around. And then this song of Mary, song of praise that she sings, is an economic revolution. That God has filled those who are hungry, continues to fill those who are hungry. Those who are rich, God has sent away empty. A Christian society is a society where no human dares to have too much while others have too little. Where every human must get only to give away. Which sends me back to the idea of what home is for all of us. Being sent away or vacation or being forced to take that time away that is allotted to me, I'm always brought back to this time of hearing God's call upon my life. The calling of home. What is home? What is home for you? Besides the obvious brick and mortar physical space you may end up at following the worship service this morning, what is home 
that is beyond yourself that, is, that God is wanting you to be a part of? Is it the passion of knitting shawls that can be given away as peace offerings for those that need a spiritual hug? Is it kneading the dough in your kitchen to make that special pie that offers God's love to someone in need of that special nudge? Is it splitting wood and delivering firewood to those that need that extra spark to keep their physical and spiritual soul warm? How will you acknowledge your home and see God being born in you. It's in the hearing of Mary's song that I heard these lyrics they were saying in the modern way by Francesca Battistelli. And I'm always reminded that my home is living into the passion and calling as being one, a child of God. And my home is also living into the passion and calling fulfilled in the life-giving work of pastoral leadership through social, moral, and economic change. So it's my prayer that today Mary's words speak to you. That they may bring us all to a sense of knowing our true home in the grace of peace, love, and salvation of God. Marie is going to sing these words for us. And I pray that they speak to you as they spoke to me in that parking lot of Covenant United Methodist Church on how God may be born in us and use us each and every day. Everything inside me cries for order. Everything inside me wants to hide. Is the shadow an angel or a warrior? If God is pleased with me, why am I so terrified? Someone tell me I am only dreaming. Somehow help me see with heaven's eyes. And before my head agrees, my heart. Oh 
prayer with me. Holy God, be born in us. Bring us home. Oh, gracious and mighty God, we are grateful for the gifts and resources that you give unto us. And so, Lord, as an act of worship, we want to give ourselves and our resources back to you. So, Lord, let ministries be born out of these abundant gifts. Amen.
Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 